Now we want to turn to the story of a man central to the civil rights movement whose name you may never have heard. Bayard Rustin was a key organizer of the 1963 March on Washington, a confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. and a tireless advocate for equality. He was also openly gay. Barack and Michelle Obama are working to restore the civil rights legend's rightful place in history with their new Netflix film called Rustin. Its star, award-winning actor Coleman Domingo, is getting rave reviews for his performance. And here he is speaking with Hari Srinivasan. Bianca, thanks. Coleman Domingo, thanks so much for joining us. First off, for uh, those in our audience that don't know who Bayard Rustin was, you play him, you did the homework. Who was he? Bayard Rustin was a young Quaker from Westchester, Pennsylvania. He was a, a young communist at a time. He was, he played the lute. He sang Elizabethan love songs. He was one of the most strategic minds and a great organizer. And in 1963, he did the monumental task with he and a, a group of what he called young angelic troublemakers. They um, were the architects for the March on Washington. We are going to put together the largest peaceful protest in the history of this nation. How big? 100,000 people. Is he for real? A massive two-day demonstration with enough power to shut down the White House and Capitol Hill made up of angelic troublemakers such as yourselves with ideas so bold, so inspiring, the execution will demand all groups draw tightly together and become one. So why is it that we don't know about him? Why is it that it's just not common knowledge in high school history books when we do read about the March on Washington? What I like to believe is is that his, he has such an impact and he was such a great um, civil rights activist and organizer and strategic human, fascinating human guy. But I think he was marginalized because he was openly gay. That's very clear to me that he was all but erased from the history books and his uh, significance and what he did. Being openly gay in that era is a whole different thing than being openly gay today. I mean, there were so many other challenges that he was facing kind of simultaneously. Well, the thing is, this man was fighting for not only, you know, civil rights, but human rights. And he was being exactly who he was in the world. You know, like, well, why I mentioned why he was a young uh, a Quaker. It's like he grew up, his grandmother, they, they were very supportive of him just being who he was in the world. So that was part of his North Star. Uh, so he didn't think it was something that was, um, he should, something he'd be ashamed of in any single way. But... We do know at that time, you know, being openly anything, being openly gay in particular, would cause harm to your, not only your body, but also to your livelihood. You can lose your job. There was no protections in any way. So therefore, therefore, he had to, had to stay subverted in many ways. So I think that that's exactly, that was part of his, his struggle. And But yet still, the one thing you couldn't deny was how smart the man was and how courageous he was and how he was, um, everyone respected him in his mind which is wild. They respected him. They called on him. Um, he was the one who uh, inspired Dr. King about Dr. King's ideologies about passive resistance. These are the things that Bayard Rustin learned, you know, from the teachings of Gandhi and Thoreau and what, like he even says, and he's, even the, the teachings of Jesus, <laughs> you know, so, but, which is wild. So, so you look at history and the way history will shine the light on some and then suppress others. It's a, a bare bones case of that. As the film points out, it's, it's not just a sort of the folks you expect to try to repress him or erase him, but it's people from now, what we would consider the more progressive corners of, say, the Democratic political machine that didn't want him to be the face of this event. They didn't want the event. Martin Luther King, he fit a profile in many single ways. There were other incredible leaders as well, men and women, who had incredible voices, yet for the movement, I think the movement wanted to gather and just say, this is exactly who we are. The other folks who didn't fit that, and Bayard Rustin was very much an outlier in every single shape and form, the way he spoke, the way he moved through spaces, the way his hair looked, the way he was dressed, he was an outlier in every sense of the, of the term. So, and also Bayard was also, you know, he was, also, the struggle was not only with the outside forces, like people like Strom Thurmond or Hoover, who were, who were using anything to um, to make this movement fall apart, but also within his own 
you know, with own brotherhood, you know, whether with the uh, NAACP in particular in our film, um, Adam Clayton Powell in particular does things, says things to discredit Byron Rustin because, you know, it's, it's all about power in many ways. Are they expecting my resignation? Some are, yes. Then they're going to have to fire me because I will not resign. On the day that I was born black, I was also born a homosexual. They either believe in freedom and justice for all, or they do not. Tell me about his relationship and friendship with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because in the film, uh, it, it's played out in an interesting way where really uh, an allegation and an accusation made about them is used to, well, silence him politically. Yeah, they were very close. They were like they were like brothers. But of course, we have to examine that this friendship and this sort of tenderness between brothers who really believed each other's minds and beings was challenged with folks. You know, they they didn't understand a relationship between an openly gay man and a straight man. I think they could not think of anything but sex in between. Instead of thinking like I know, it's like no, that's a deep friendship, and brotherhood. Uh, but because, again, it's biases of the world and what they put on it. And then that was also threatening to not only within uh, the movement, but it was, in, it was threatening to outside the movement. People can use it um, in any way, shape or form and even lie about it. I think, you know, from what I know, I, I think there was a, a picture made, like created of like uh, Martin Luther King in the bathtub and by a Rustin sitting in a chair nearby or something to, to be suggestive, to see if it can be used to like discredit both of them, to bring down the movement. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of forces, as much as we were, people were coming together for the um, fight for civil rights, there are many forces that were trying to <laughs> make it fall apart within the parties and, and outside of it as well. So I think um, I, from what I knew in the way, in the way that Amel Amin and I played it, Amel is Martin Luther King, he's beautiful and he's playing Martin in a way, as sort of as a young man who doesn't have it all figured out just yet. So you see the relationship that they had of sort of teacher and student, which is what we wanted to experience. And then also see how the thing that I think was important to us is to see the tenderness between these men that one would never really imagine, the tenderness between these two. who They had to, they had to be intimate to, to really support each other for this fight for civil rights. They had to. So that's what we wanted to explore. Intimate in the loving brotherhood sense, <laughs> you know? So tell me a little bit about what it's like playing someone like Bayard Rustin when you are also a left-handed, black, gay man who would be 51 when you were acting this role. Yeah. <laughs> the similarities are, are staggering. And then the difference are also profound. But what we meet in the middle uh, feels like, it feels so special and it feels like the right thing in the right time. Um, by Rustin playing him came along at this perfect time in my life and career where I feel like, you know, it's, it's taken 32 years of work to pour into a character like this and to lead a film like this. This is, um, he has so much size and so much purpose and intent. He gave his life to, into the fight and struggle for civil, civil rights. That's something that many people can't say. People, you know, people are activists when it's convenient, but this person was like, an activist always, even when he was in high school, you know, protesting lunches and things like that. But he, that's exactly a dedication. So I, I think it's a profound privilege because I think that even as I find myself as an artist, finding um, even more mindfulness and intention with what I'm doing is even more important, especially in this phase of my career. So I feel so blessed and so honored that I get to share with folks this man who is such a personal hero to the entire world. It's an, it's an incredible honor. When did you first uh, learn about him? Because uh, as we just discussed, it's his history is not common knowledge. Well, I stumbled upon Bayard Rustin at, in college. Now, not even in a class or a course. I joined the African-American Student Union because I was very curious about, you know, discovering more of my, my history, having more, um, I don't know, camaraderie with fellow African-Americans. Mm -hmm. So I joined the student union and we were having a discussion about the civil rights movement. And then his name came up sort of as a footnote. 
And it was because I think a few things came up like, oh, Laker, Westchester, Pennsylvania, openly gay, organized the March on Washington. I was like, wait, what? And then even more so, he sang Elizabethan love songs. He played the lute. I was like, wait, who is this person? And how come I don't know about him? That's strange. Yeah. You know, I'm from Pennsylvania. But also I just thought like, this is a profound human. Why don't we know his story? And then the more digging I did, I, I finally realized why. I was like, oh, because it was openly gay. And whoever has direct dealings with Mr. Hoover, let him know that on August 28th, black, white, young, old, rich, working class, poor, will descend on Washington, D.C. And there's nothing he can do to stop it. The pace at which the March on Washington was organized seems staggering on so many different levels, even without kind of racial challenges that we might face today, to try to pull together 100,000 humans to one location uh, when not everybody can afford to fly. I mean, there's just layer upon layer. And as I look at it, I'm like, and they did it seven weeks? Oh, yeah. And they did it. Let's all remember, they did it without social media. They did it <laughs> without clicking. And they, it was really grassroots organizing at its best. And he, they did it in less than, in about seven weeks' time. That's outstanding. So the idea of this strategist in this mind, he was like, no, we can galvanize and get all these groups, whether it's the LCLC, the you know, NAACP, you name it, all to come together. He really believed, I mean, I think that's, he was outside of his, in his thinking, which is great. And also he worked with a lot of young people because I think he also preferred working with young people because he said, they're not rigid. They, have, they believe in possibility. They believe in the, the unexpected. They're like, yes, let's go on a ledge and believe that we can actually get this done. And they did it. But they, they also harness and galvanize unions and coalitions, which is something that, you know, I mean, they understood. I have to gather people and invite the unions to be a part of this. Everyone is a part of this fight in some way, shape, or form. So he knew those are the things and tactics that he knew. Very strategic, very detailed. And he knew that he can get it done. So what was tough as an actor? I mean, going through all of the material, seeing pictures of him, seeing maybe video of him in different places, what did you pick up on? What was the hardest for you? Is it his physicality? Is it the, the, the accent? Well, you know, I've always done work when it comes to accent work, physical work. I come from the theater, so I think that's always been a part of what I do. And now I'm a, I'm a bit of a shapeshifter. I, I know that because I think that's what I, I like to fully embody a character in every single way. So those things I knew how to build and I'm very rigorous in my work. So I just work at it and work at it for hours upon hours. And, and um, because I just want to, you know, really honor and get it right and then recede because I don't want people to see the work. I want to actually you just see the person. That's always been my goal. So what kind of homework are you able to do? What sort what is, what remains in the archives, what kinds of data were you able to pull up? The strangest thing is there's a lot, <laughs> which is great. You know, yeah, there's books on his writings. I love, I think writing people's letters are a great key to their mind and the way they think and the way they feel. You can find letters between he and Dr. King. You can find um, some interviews and some debates. And, you know, whether his debates were successful or not, but you just watch him work. You watch his, the way he speaks which is actually about three actors higher than mine in pitch, the way he moves his body through spaces, which is very sort of fluid and fantastic. And his fingers always move like birds, the way he smokes. So you can, you can, you can find a lot. You were able to meet with several people who knew Bayer. He passed away in 1987, including uh, one of his partners, organizers who knew him. What, how do they remember him today? Oh man, I was just uh, texting. I text Rachelle Horowitz all the time now. We're, we're very close. And I'm meeting with Walter Nagel for lunch, um, who's by its partner. And they all remember him. First of all, the thing I must say, because it's, it's on my heart, that they were, they said that they've been getting lots of responses that people are calling them. And I think it feels like Bayard's alive again. So people mm. are calling, oh my gosh, that moment in particular when Coleman puts down his cigarette and stomps it out. I've witnessed that many times. Bayard did that. Did you know that? I was like, no, she said, there was something, she says, you must, I'm, she says, she's not a spiritual person, she said, but there's something spiritual around the portrayal. It feels like we're calling on each other. And that's what I feel. And they, they feel very proud of the film. They feel proud that his story is out there and his legacy is, um, and his importance is out in the world. Because I think that they, they've always looked at him as like such a, 
he was always on there at Mount Rushmore. And now he, we really do marvelize him now uh, with our film. But we also make sure that it's human because he's not a perfect person. He's kind of messy at times in his private life. And that's all to show a real full human being. So they're, they're very happy. And I, that makes me happier because more than any criticism of the film in any shape or way or form, I feel like um, I needed to know that they knew that I took care of them more than anyone. Yeah. He was uh, posthumously given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, and President Obama and Michelle Obama are part of the sort of producing team of this. Do you have any idea if they've seen it, what their feedback is? They have seen it, loved it, clapped for it, introduced on, me Arizona. to the HBCU First Look Film Festival because of it. They are such champions of this film and by Russell's legacy. I, they couldn't be more lovely and wonderful with uh, making sure that you know, by Rustin is on everyone's lips. What's it mean to you as a person and as an actor that you got to play somebody who's kind of a personal hero to you? I mean, does it add, I don't know, anxiety or, or stress to wanting to get it right because this is somebody you looked up to? Or how do you how do you process this? Oh, Harry, you know what? It was why when I first when I was first offered this role, I thought. I could go one or two ways. I could be terrified <laughs> or I don't have time to be terrified. I have to get down to work. That's what I felt. I said, I just have to get down to work and I have to work exceptionally hard because I know that that's what my hero did. He worked exceptionally hard every single day to make this country a little better. And so my job was just to stay focused in on that. I feel like I've been given such a gift, especially right now, when, when a film like this is out in the world, when I think we need um, to rally the spirits of people and, and let ordinary people know that they can make a difference just by showing up and being a part of it. Mm. Um, I think we need it more than ever. And I feel very, very blessed that it's, it, it's out right now that I've been, a, that when people get to know who Byron Rustin is, I'm the face of Byron Rustin. That's beautiful. I feel like I know for sure this goes down into my, my personal, my, my legacy. This is a legacy work, and, and, and I know it is. I look forward to, you know, children and children upon children, you know, learning about By Rustin and, and knowing that they think of me at the same time. Actor Coleman Domingo, who plays Rustin, it's on Netflix now. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Harry.